This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. It's not a magic name. We can't just wave it over everything and all of a sudden things begin to happen because we ask it in the name of Jesus. What does it mean to ask in my name? The name of Jesus is not a formula to open up heaven to you. The name of Jesus is the power of attorney. We ask as if Jesus was speaking. Power of attorney does not go against our attorney or against the law. Does Jesus affirm your prayer? Would he himself pray the same prayer and ask for the same thing? Jesus doesn't want his name attached to something he doesn't agree with. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. I began a two-part series yesterday on the importance of prayer, talking about prayer and maturity, how the two walk hand in hand, because there's so much ignorance on the subject of prayer. And really, I even pointed this out yesterday, that when you're born again, God's first command is not to pray. Although praying is fine, no, his first command is to go to the word of God. Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed. He pointed out that if you'll turn your life over to him, that uh, he'll give you rest. And uh, he promises then that he will make you a child of God, but make you also a disciple of his. And so continuing the word of God is very important. And so we covered all that, but we came to a point yesterday where we talked about, and we ended with this point, who has the right to pray? Doesn't everybody have the right to pray? And the answer is no. And we, we hear the world talk about it. Well, I prayed. Okay, well, that's fine. But let me quote you a verse of scripture out of John chapter nine. Take a look at verse 31 with me. While you're finding that verse of scripture, I'm offering a series on flash drive on the subject of prayer, types of prayer, just about everything I've taught on prayer. This, what I'm teaching right now, is not specifically on there, but I want you to take this and apply this to the uh, what you're gonna learn from that uh, flash drive uh, and the series of things that are on there. Uh, the announcer, come on halftime, tell you how you can have a copy of that for yourself. John chapter nine and verse 31, here was a crowd talking to Jesus and really they were coming at him and the crowd was speaking truth from the word of God, but they were gonna use it to manipulate. Just like a person say, well, the Bible says this, doesn't. well, then why does it say that? And they'll quote correctly what the Bible says, but they'll say, well, this contradicts it. That's what they wanted to do. But here's what it says in John 9, 31, speaking to Jesus, we know God does not hear sinners. And that's true. He goes on to say, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. They were qualifying that an unbeliever doesn't uh, get answers from God, but not every Christian gets an answer from God. You have to be a worshiper of God. You've given your life to him, but you also have to understand his word. This is the key of which I'm using right here in this teaching to show you that the best prayer warriors are those who understand the word of God. The unbelievers covered first of all in this verse of scripture. Does God hear the prayers of a sinner? a Buddhist, a Muslim, maybe a Unitarian or something. Well, it seems not from this verse of scripture. God will hear the prayer of a sinner who no longer wants to be a sinner. And this is found in Luke 18, verse 13. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the first prayer a person can pray that God will hear if they even use prayer to become a Christian. You don't have to pray the prayer uh, to uh, become a Christian. Just believe in Jesus Christ, but you can form it in a prayer. That's fine. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So there may be lots of different ways that people say they pray, but unless you come through Jesus Christ, there's no way you're going to get an answer. First Timothy 2 and verse 5 says this, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I didn't say it, Jesus said. He said, there's only one mediator. Paul said this, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So unless as a sinner, you know how to approach God and come through Jesus Christ, then you're not gonna get saved. And afterwards, as a Christian, then if you don't come through the mediator, Jesus Christ, if you just pray, and he told us how to pray, but again, if you just do that, then you may be praying, but you're not praying correctly according to the word of God. I simply come back to this. A lot of Christians talk about prayer and the fact they're even on prayer teams and all this other stuff, but they just do it because everybody else is doing it, thinking they know how to pray 
when it really comes back to the importance of understanding the word of God. Any prayer made to Buddha, any prayer made to Allah never gets to God the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Psalm teaches us that all other gods worshiped by men are demons. A believer's first prayer should be thanksgiving because of entrance into God's courts. That's why we enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, be thankful to him, bless his name. That's Psalm 100 and verse four. This is true for a time of church praise and worship, but it's also true for a time of entering into God's kingdom and also into God's presence as a Christian. A believer is second of all covered in this verse of scripture. It says this again, that you must be a worshiper of God and that you must do his will. A believer is covered in this verse and prayers which can be answered must be prayed by a Christian who understands God's will and is doing it. It comes back to what we talked about yesterday. Do you have an account in the bank and do you have money to deposit in that account? You can't write a check unless you've got a checking account. Well, to have a checking account is like being saved. The moment I get saved, I've opened a checking account. But as I begin to grow in God's word, I make deposits into that checking account. And it's from those deposits that I can write a check out or go to God in prayer. So it simply comes back to this. I guess the best thing I can say about prayer too is God really answers prayers his way, not your way. Prayers are not a formula to get God to do just anything that you want him to do. That's not it. That is immaturity. And the point of it is you've got Christians been born again for 10 years, 20 years. They're still approaching God just to get anything they want. I want to be left alone so I can live for myself. Then when I do get into trouble, I want him to hear my prayer and deliver me. Then leave me alone again. Now that is someone who won't, God wants to answer prayer, but he wants to answer prayers for people who have fellowship with him, love him, commune with him. And that takes a disciple. Prayer is intended for every season of life in prosperity as well as poverty. So why do you pray only when you're in poverty and when the money starts to come in, you don't pray anymore? Prayer isn't intended just to yank you out of every bad circumstance, but sometimes that's what we get in life. It's also to be done in times of rejoicing because really prayer can be praise to God. In times of rejoicing, as well as in times of turmoil, why is it the only time you think about praying is when all hell is breaking loose in your life? Turmoil's all around you. You think maybe I ought to pray. In times of closeness with God, not just times of desperation and loneliness. So again, in times of closeness with God, this is a time we should pray. And this is the prayers of love, admiration, praise to God, thanking him. You know, perhaps if you did more of that, you wouldn't run into those times of desperation and loneliness. God would become your best friend. Jesus Christ would become your best friend. And the power of the Holy Spirit would be with you always. It comes back to this, maturity must guide our prayers. The most powerful prayer you can pray is praying the word and praying in line with the word. I've said it twice yesterday. I'm saying it again today. The most powerful prayer you can pray is praying the word of God. Those prayers of Ephesians where Paul took the word of God and made a prayer out of it. Wow. I mean that you would know the will of God, that you would know how to walk in the word of God, that you know the goodness, you know the future, you know the past of where you've come from, where you're headed to. In all of that, putting it into a prayer for the Ephesian saints, that was really intercessory prayer. Paul wasn't praying that for himself. He was praying intercessory prayer. And we sometimes get this idea that intercessory prayer is only praying in tongues. That's not true. It may lead up to praying for someone else, but when you pray in tongues, you're really praying for yourself. You know not what you should pray for as you ought, so you pray in tongues. But once the revelation comes and you can line it up with the word of God, the best prayers you can pray over anybody is to pray the word of God over them. Our prayer motive is primary to answered prayer. Motives behind your prayer are keys to it. John 14, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, don't take that one too far. Whatever we ask, no, we have to line it up with other scripture. You can't just build it on one scripture, but notice this, the name of Jesus is important. Jesus said again, if you ask it in my name, I'll do it. So the Father may be glorified in the Son. The key to receiving Jesus as Savior, the key to eternal life is going through the mediator to the Father. It's also the key to answered prayers. I pray to the Father through the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, 
I ask this in the name of Jesus. Father, start your prayer. You make your petition to the Lord and you end it with the name of Jesus. But I want you to understand something too. The name of Jesus isn't some magic wand. You can wave it and get whatever you want to. No, your desires it must be the primary thing in the prayer. The motive behind your prayer is the key to answered prayer. James chapter one, verses six and seven. Let him ask in faith. You know what faith is? Your knowledge of the word of God without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Well, James chapter four and verse three is a key one for me. I love this verse of scripture. Why do you ask and don't receive? Because you ask amiss that you can consume it on your own lust. Loretta and I ran into that. Loretta's my wife and I mean, we ran into that. When I first went to work for Kenneth Hagin and his ministry, uh, we I didn't get paid a lot. I mean, I, I got paid half what I got paid as being a manager of a store in the world. And so by being paid half, I wasn't making very much money, but we had this need in our life. And so I also made cassette tapes on the side. I worked for, I, I actually worked for uh, also on the side with full gospel businessmen. And I gave them certain amounts off of every cassette that came in. And so, uh, so again, we, we set a figure. There was a big conference coming to town and the specific ministry to be there. And I mean, this conference was going to be huge. I was the only one duplicating tapes and we both believed together. We're going to receive $10,000. So we prayed and we said, Lord, we want to receive $10,000. We do it. And we did it in the name of Jesus. We quoted scriptures over it, Mark 11, 23, 24. And we prayed that. And by the end of that conference, when it was all over, we got $3,000 and we were disappointed. There was a real tendency in us to say, this stuff doesn't work. We only cleared $3,000, not $10,000. But we suddenly realized something. What were we going to do with the $10,000? Well, we really didn't have any plans for it. There was nothing. I mean, we just picked an arbitrary figure because after all, that verse of scripture says, whatever you ask in my name, you'll get it. Well, we were doing it to consume it on our own lust. James 4 says that you ask, but you don't receive because you ask amiss, that you can consume it on your own lust. We literally forgot the lust part and decided we'll just take the word of God and use it for us. So again, when I was working for Kenneth Hagin Ministries, what we needed a car and the, the man that ran the ministry, not Brother Hagen, but the man that ran the ministry had a Lincoln, a brand new Lincoln. And we both agreed together. He was going to give us that car. It never happened. It never happened. Besides that, my first thought is if I get the Lincoln, I'm going to sell it because I don't like Lincolns. But that's what my thing was. Well, we learned as time passed, answered prayers increase as our maturity increased. So it does with you. Knowing what God does not say about prayer will be what we're going to take a look in the second half of this broadcast for you. I want to comment too here at this particular point. Thank you. Those of you who support the broadcast, I love you and appreciate you. Listen, you're part of my prayers and I pray in maturity about you. Father, thank you for their generous heart because they're giving toward the most important thing that you have ever set down before us, winning souls. The highest priority of God the Father is winning souls, then making disciples out of them. That's what you give for. A lot of people give their lives to Jesus through this broadcast, but more people are brought up as disciples. That's all still part of the Great Commission. And this is what God wants. Again, because God doesn't want just Christians in this earth. He wants mature Christians. We should be praying for our government leaders, not that they'll just say, but they'll come to the full knowledge of the truth. And so I'd like you to become a partner with me in giving in this area. And so would you go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me. And by doing that, we've joined our hearts and are giving together for the great thing that God wants, winning souls and making disciples of all nations. See you after the break. In Ephesians 6, 18, the expanded translation says, praying always at all times with all prayer, different kinds of prayer and supplication, that is praying in the spirit. The prayer flash drive presents a biblical explanation of each type of prayer found in scripture, including praying in the spirit, binding and loosing, the prayer of consecration, the prayer of agreement, the prayer of faith, and many more. The flash drive also includes a series on the power of prayer and the prayers of Paul. In studying the prayers of Paul, you will learn that Paul rarely prayed for his own needs. He mainly prayed for others, especially for believers. The prayer flash drive contains 37 MP3 audio lessons by Bob Yandian, a topical study on prayer. To order the prayer flash drive, go to bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, 
This teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Well, for two and a half broadcasts, or maybe one and a half broadcasts, this halfway to the second broadcast, we've been talking about what God has to say about prayer. But I want to point out to you what God does not say about prayer, because this is really key and important. There are more verses about God's promises not to answer prayer than those found in the Bible about God promises to answer prayer. This shocks a lot of Christians, but you know what? God really protects prayer. He wants it to be done in the right motive. That's why he asks us to grow it before we start really seeking him for things in prayer and things for other people. Again, God can answer prayers you have when you're very immature. It's much like when your child comes up to you and asks for a big package of gum and you think you're not going to chew all that gum. But you know what? You love them so much. They're so immature. And they just came to you with big eyes wide open that you went ahead and did it. Okay. But that doesn't work when they're 15 years old. That doesn't work when they're 20 years old. There comes because now they're more familiar with life and their their, uh, requests are much more educated educated in what they're asking. This is what God wants. He wants our prayers to be educated through the word of God. Look with me at Proverbs chapter one. We're going to take a look at reasons why God does not answer prayer. And in verse 21, uh, pardon me, verse Proverbs chapter one, verse 24 through 31. And here's what the Lord says, because I have called you and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regards but you have said it not all my counsel, that's his word, and listen to none of my reproofs, that's again his word. I, God, will laugh at you when your calamity comes. I will mock you when your fear comes. When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then shall they call on me and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear or the reverence of the Lord. They would not keep any of my counsel. There's your deposits in your checking account. They despised all of my reproofs. Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Instead of trying to make God see things your way, you need to see things God's way. That's really the issue in prayer. Quit looking at prayers. Here's what I want. Start looking at prayers. What does God want out of this prayer? Then your prayers will be answered. It comes back to this. God doesn't answer every prayer of a Christian. That was pointed out in that, that phrase that the, that the people said to Jesus. We know he doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner. And also he hears the prayers of those who, who reverence him and also are living for him. And so that's the first prerequisite, be born again. Next of all, be a mature believer. And he says here that God doesn't answer all prayers of Christians. Just as we can be assured of drawing money out of a bank, if we have an account with money in it, we can be just as assured of answered prayers. So is the opposite. If we don't come to God by his word and obedience to it, we have no assurance of answered prayer. We have no capital of which to cash that check on. Let's take one of these, Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You can pray, but God simply, it's not that God's ears are deaf and he can't hear it. He just won't regard it. This means to regard iniquity, God won't regard my prayer. If I know I've done something wrong, who am I to think I can keep on living the way I am, not ask God to forgive me, somehow think it's not as bad as as I think it is, you know, or God thinks it is. No, no, it's all right. Your wife's been telling you you missed it. Your kids tell you you missed it. Your friends tell you you missed it. But you keep disregarding that. You go, no, 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 I think it's okay. And God, even the Holy Spirit's been convicting you, telling you it's wrong. It says, if I regard it, iniquity in my heart. I know I've done wrong. I know I've sinned. I just will not confess it. The Lord will not hear me. The sin needs to be forgiven first by 1 John 1, 9, and then the Lord will hear your prayer. Psalm 84, verses 11 and 12. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. He provides life and he shields you from bad things. The sun provides life, the shield protects you. So the Lord is for me a provider and a protector, a sun and a shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Isn't that interesting? It's so simple. He won't withhold anything from you when you walk uprightly according to the word of God. Again, answered prayer is related to maturity. 
God relates answered prayer more to our fellowship with him than our relationship with him. Understand that he might answer your prayer in the beginning when you're first born again because you're related to him and you're a child of God and you're key when you come to him for prayer. But I want you to notice something else. First John chapter five, verses 14 and 15. But doesn't the word God say, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and we have the petition we desire of him? Of course it does. It says then in first John four or five, verses 14 and 15. But the key to this verse is according to his will. No one must there, uh, so not only must there be no hidden or known sin, but we also must know we're walking according to God's word. We're not doing the don'ts of the word of God, but we're not doing the do's of the word of God. The Bible says, don't do this and we don't do that, but here's what you're supposed to do. And if you don't do that, then don't think you're gonna get answers from God. We might also ask God for something we're not ready for and cannot handle. God won't give it to us. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. He will withhold something that's not good. He will withhold something that's bad for you. Your four-year-old may want to play with a butcher's knife, but someday that may be a good thing as we have grown and are capable of handling it. Then you'll give him the butcher knife. But prayers and answers to prayers are not a gift of grace, but a reward of good works. I'm going to say that again. Prayer and answers to prayer are not a gift of grace, but a reward of good works. We are saved unto good works. And one of those good works we're saved unto is prayer. That's found in Ephesians chapter two and verse 10. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's prayer. Notice again, he doesn't just answer prayer out of grace and say, here, you know, despite your lifestyle, you're going to have, that's the new birth. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to those things in life, prayer is rewarded for diligently seeking him. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when we die, our works, that includes answered prayer, follow us, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. What about praying in the name of Jesus? Let's talk about that, John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But Understand this, according to all those other verses, we have to apply that verse in a multitude of counsel, a multitude of other verses, not just isolate one scripture. Whatever I ask in Jesus' name, God will do it. So I'm asking for this and you're doing it to consume it on your own lust. You're doing it even with sin in your life. When God said, if you do it for your own lust, I won't give it to you when you're doing it and there's sin in your life, I won't answer your prayer. I won't even hear your prayer. God has simply told us here in the word of God and what he's referring to this, Jesus' name is not a magic wand. It's not a magic name. We can't just wave it over everything and all of a sudden things begin to happen because we ask it in the name of Jesus. What does it mean to ask in my name? The name of Jesus is not a formula to open up heaven to you. The name of Jesus is the power of attorney. We ask as if Jesus was speaking. Power of attorney does not go against our attorney or against the law. Does Jesus affirm your prayer? Would he himself pray the same prayer and ask for the same thing? Jesus doesn't want his name attached to something he doesn't agree with. The entire Trinity backs legitimate prayers. The Father bought us with the blood of his son, Jesus. God can answer the prayers of a sinner who accepts Jesus because Jesus paid for the answer to the prayer. God can answer the prayer of a believer because Jesus paid for everything that pertains to life and godliness. All scriptural prayer is answered by the power of the Holy Spirit. That prayer is made according to God's will and paid for again by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look at James chapter five and verse 16. The effective, fervent, that means effective means it's working. Fervent means it's operating. Prayer of a righteous man, this is before God and men. You're righteous before God, you're righteous before men, avails or overcomes much. What are these things saying? What have I been covering in the past two days, yesterday and into today? I've been covering this. God wants to answer prayer, but he wants you to grow up. There's a favorite verse of scripture of mine that I write down when I sign a book, and that's Isaiah 33, 6. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and strength of salvation. What's that verse say? Wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is the correct application of the word of God. Knowledge is the correct intake of the word of God. Not only am I to take in the word of God, I understand correctly on that scripture. And again, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. If there's anything the world needs is stable Christians. You know what that means? What the world needs is stable prayers. 
stability because you understand the word and apply it to every area of your life. That's you. God wants you to be effective. So the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. What brings stability? Not just the fact I decide I'm going to be stable. No, wisdom and knowledge. So that's where it comes back to prayer. I don't just pray because I decide to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray. No, the the a righteous man prays. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. So wisdom and knowledge should be the stability of your prayers. And that's where it comes back to that goes on to say, wisdom and knowledge should be the stability of your times and strength of salvation. How do you know you're born again? Have you ever woke up one day and wondered if you're really born again? Have you ever felt like you weren't born again? I have. Even years after I was born again, there's days I didn't feel like God was even close to me. I felt like he was in heaven millions of miles away, not regarding the scripture that he lives on the inside of me. He's right here all the time. He's in my heart and in the words of my mouth. That's Romans chapter 10. But again, as I begin to understand that, there's times when I didn't feel like I was saved. I know you've gone through those times. And then you start looking to your feelings. I don't feel like I'm saved. What does feelings have to do with it? Wisdom and knowledge should be the stability of your times, but wisdom and knowledge will also be the strength of your salvation. How do I know I'm saved? Because the word of God says so. How do you get saved? You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess him with your mouth as your Lord and Savior. Did you do that? Then you are saved. It comes from the word of God. Now I can aim my prayers correctly at God because I'm a righteous man, knowing I'm righteous, not based on my feelings, but based on my knowledge of the word of God. I know that I know I'm saved. These things we write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. You know what? I know I have eternal life because the word of God declares that these things, he says, we write to you that you may know. I know I have eternal life, but there's one more thing to go. It says wisdom and knowledge should be the stability of your times and strength of salvation. And the final thing says that the fear of the Lord is his treasure. The number one thing in my life is the word of God. Not the fact I can get a car, not the fact I can believe God for finances like that. That's fine. But the reason why is the word of God is my treasure. The most important thing in my life is the word of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. How do I get it added unto me? Prayer, but what must come first? I must have that the word of God is the highest thing in my life. Seek first the kingdom of God and seeking to walk after righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you and they can be added unto you in prayer. So it simply comes back to this. What's the most powerful thing in your life? The word of God. Outside of Jesus living in your heart, the word of God operating through you and that will back your prayers. I simply want to know and I want to hear from you about prayers that you begin to pray now because you line it up with God's word to begin to answer far beyond what's ever happened before. Look forward to hearing from you. Have a good time. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.